This week on Vaticano, Rome celebrates the Feast of Pentecost. Pope Francis invokes the Holy Spirit and warns that without the Spirit, the Church would be just an organization. All stand together, meet a group striving to boost the voice of persecuted Christians. Hidden treasures in Rome are being restored. Join us on a visit to the church that holds the splendid frescoes of St. Jerome. Discover this and more on this week's Vaticano. Several thousand faithful representing over a hundred million active members of the Catholic Charismatic Renewal gathered in the Vatican for Pentecost weekend. Pope Francis welcomed them at the Pope Paul VI Hall where he launched the new Catholic Charismatic Renewal International Service that takes over the roles previously played by two organizations, the ICCR and the CF. Today, one thing ends and another begins. A new stage of this journey is beginning, a stage marked by communion between all the members of the charismatic family, in which the mighty presence of the Holy Spirit is manifested for the good of the entire Church. The Holy Father explained that the new organism will help to fulfill the Church's mission of evangelization through three main charisms, baptism in the Holy Spirit, unity of the body of Christ, and service to the poor. After his address, the Holy Father invited them to stand and observe a minute of silence for peace. Later in the evening, the participants joined the faithful of the Diocese of Rome in celebrating the vigil of the Feast of Pentecost. The Mass was celebrated with the presence of the icon of divine love. Exactly 75 years ago, Pope Pius XII made a special prayer of thanksgiving to Our Lady of Divine Love for the protection of the city of Rome from the destruction of the Second World War. Recalling the event, Pope Francis said that he wishes for Romans to recognize and spread the maternal love of the Church for humanity, the mercy, the tenderness of which there's so many needs. So we will really get on the road. We will then feel within us the fire of Pentecost, which urges us to cry out to the men and women of this city and their slavery is over and that Christ is the way that leads to the city of heaven. Obedient to the call of the Holy Father and filled with the Holy Spirit, the faithful went on a night-long pilgrimage throughout the busiest heart of Rome. The procession is first of all to have a very strong, very beautiful church experience, that we all live together, especially during the Vigil of Pentecost to invoke the Holy Spirit on our diocese, as the Pope also said. He recalled that today is the birthday of the Church. Without the Holy Spirit, there is no Church today. Without the Holy Spirit, the Church does not go out. Without the Holy Spirit, the Church cannot live the testimony of the Risen One. We are a people of faith, and we celebrate faith together. Faith is not something that one lives alone intimately. Faith, if you share, you celebrate. Not hiding their joy, the participants sang and prayed as they processed. Along the way, churches were wide open to welcome the icon of divine love for a short prayer. This manifestation of faith was unusual for the usual celebration of Pentecost in modern-day Rome. Just a few hours later, the same streets hosted a gay pride event. This night-long procession for Pentecost was a beautiful surprise even for the participants. 
For more than 50 years of life, it had never happened to me before to have such a beautiful procession with Our Lady of Divine Love, who, for us Romans, is Our Lady. Here we are, fond of passing in the heart of the city on this night of Pentecost to give space for her, to give space for her words and the magisterium of the Pope. Playing for her was a pleasure, with a little effort, but a great pleasure. Weekend of Pentecost finished with the solemn mass in St. Peter's Square. Pope Francis invoked the Holy Spirit for all the church and warned that without the Spirit, the church will become an organization. Her mission, propaganda, and communion would be an effort. Without the Spirit, Jesus remains a personage from the past. With the Spirit, he is a person alive in our own time. Without the Spirit, Scripture is a dead letter. With the Spirit, it is a word of life. A Christianity without the Spirit is a joyless moralism. With the Spirit, it is life. That's why Pope Francis paid so much attention to Pentecost weekend, meeting three times with the charismatic renewal participants. He wants that filled with the Holy Spirit, the Church may bring harmony to a tormented world. This year, there are 400 children participants of the children's train. Half of them come from Genoa, and it is children who have been affected in some way who have suffered the impact of the collapse of the Morandi Bridge last summer. The other half come from Sardinia and Olbia, from Taralba and several towns that have unfortunately been hit in 2013 and then in 2018 by floods that have strongly impacted the lives of children and their families. The children have prepared a lot of surprises for Pope Francis. They will bring gifts from their hometowns and drawings and poems. It is all the work they have done, what they have developed during the year. It will be transmitted to give a message of hope. In fact, the theme of the initiative is to build bridges and to break down any isolation so the children will also tell through their drawings their works to Pope Francis how they have overcome the tragedies they have experienced, but especially how they imagine their future. A future, obviously, of sharing, of encounter, of dialogue, is a future made up of bridges of love and not walls. A very good teacher taught me this. Never, never hate a companion or a schoolmate. Never. Never talk bad about others. Do you understand? Let's say it together. And what should I do when I want to talk bad of others? I have an infallible recipe, a recipe for not talking bad about others. Do you want me to tell you? Be aware. When you feel like talking bad about others, bite your tongue. Strong, strong. And so your tongue swells and you won't be able to speak. Do you understand? Never talk bad about others. The great wars that there are now, 
that people kill each other in wars begin like this, with little hatred and small things. This is something the teacher taught me. The Children's Train is an initiative promoted and implemented by the Cortile de Gentili, which is a department of the Pontifical Council for Culture for dialogue between believers and non-believers. We have been organizing it for seven years in collaboration with the Italian State Railway. In a few minutes, we'll present you a digital platform that stands for persecuted Christians. Stand Together is a digital platform created to give a voice to persecuted Christians. The platform was founded three years ago after Pope Francis pointed out publicly that Christians in some places are suffering also because of the indifference and silence of Christians elsewhere. To respond to this appeal, a group of people led by two Rome-based journalists, Roberto Fontolan and Antonio Olivier, created this digital platform, allstandtogether.com, to break indifference and silence. Since we work in the field of communication, information, news, we are not creating uh, schools or hospitals or refugee camps because there are a lot of people that do this kind of job in a beautiful way. So we would like to, to intercept and to touch the public opinion about the fate of the Christians in those countries. When you have persecuted Christians, every time you have persecuted Christians, you have for sure a history of forgiveness, charity, courage, and many values that are values interesting for television if you do a professional work. Why do you think the Christians are persecuted? I can understand why, why are they persecuted. I think that there are many institutions, many organizations that, that can explain uh, better than me, no? because I, I am a journalist and, and for me it's, it's amazing no? how, how you can find that extraordinary stories no? about common people but with Christian, Christian values and how under this thir this, that circumstances they, they show the better they, they have. We are not only helping them, but we uh, receive and help from them uh, in our faith, in our hope, in our courage, in our freedom. So we are learning a lot of things from this Christian community suffering in those countries. Now there are two main things that are happening. One, they need our help. They need to be known. They, they need to be reached by our love and sympathy. And on the other side, they are teaching us something. So we want to work on this double kind of feelings. places where the people are living under persecution, the number of Christians and the number of Catholics, they are growing year by year. Why do you think it's happening? Because I, I think that is uh, you have the, 
they are they they have confidence in their values they have they they try to find a reason to for, for the res resilience in their faith no they they try to to live their faith in a in a way that is radical no? and what do you find difficult in your work to raise awareness of 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 uh, christians i don't know maybe sometimes uh some media company doesn't want your story because of some issues or uh, you cannot tell some things because of you know political correctness mm -hmm. do you receive this these problems or you you have another kind of problems in your work no the, the problem I, I think that the, the main problem is that sometimes it is not difficult to reach to the places where they are for instance in Nigeria mm -hmm. it's quite difficult because uh, the places or the cities where um, there is persecution just now, just today, uh, you don't have. Uh, it's, it's not. It's not easy to travel there because the government doesn't give you the permission and the visa and so on. If you send a, a good story, an extraordinary story, I remember just now one uh, one story of a, a medical doctor in Iraq that he sometimes need to heal also terrorists. You know? So people of the East is in, in his clinic. No? And some colleagues uh, say to him, don't do that, uh, you are wasting your time. Uh, you are not doing the right thing. But he said to us, okay, I am Catholic, and I think that this is a, this is a human being, so I need to, to heal uh, him. So this is this is amazing uh, and if you uh, if you offer this story to a to a media a big media i think that they are interested also. so you need to to have a good story a good testimony and it works so in a way it's, it's really um good news that you're trying to provide to all the world about the uh, situations of Christians that are in difficulties, but indeed uh, they're, they're, they're in difficulties, but their story are very often are joyful. That is, that's a paradox. We yeah. can say that uh, ver very often good news are not news yeah. uh, from the media system, let's say, but I, I think that we, we have to, 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 to fight against this kind of psychological or cultural or maybe political war. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So Thank, much much for you. The Thank you to you. Thank you. After a short break, St. Jerome's life is getting back its colors. Stay with us. divided between temptation and rigor. One of the most important scholars ever, St. Jerome, is certainly one of the most intriguing and interesting saints among the doctors of the church. In the heart of Rome, a stone's throw away from the Ara Pacis, symbol of peace of the Emperor Augustus Caesar, stands one of the most beautiful churches dedicated to the saint. St. Jerome of the Croatians. As well as St. Jerome, Pope Sixtus V, who commissioned the building of the church, was of Balkan origins, almost as if to pay homage to his own roots. Today, the Croatian tradition is preserved by Father Marko Duran, Vice Rector of the Pontifical Croatian College of St. Jerome. Inside the church, among the many treasures, are three frescoes by Giovanni Guerra, representing different moments in the life of the saint. The first on the left shows us Saint Jerome in the desert, in a cave where he sits, resting on a rock where he discusses with doctors of the law the difficult passages of the Holy Scripture. 
Then we also find several symbols of St. Jerome on this fresco, such as a skull with the cross placed on it. There are several animals that are also, in a way, symbols of St. Jerome. First of all, there is the lion as its main symbol. We always find it next to St. Jerome. Other small animals that somehow present the passion that St. Jerome during his life before being baptized had to suffer, which then won with his great, great ability and the effort he made. Then the second fresco represents the priestly ordination of St. Jerome that took place in the city of Antioch after the time he spent in the desert of Syria. St. Jerome was ordained by a priest by Bishop Paulinus in Antioch. This is the second fresco that represents this moment when the bishop who has him ordained a priest puts in his hands the chalice, the pyx to make holy mass. It is a moment of priestly ordination. And the third fresco we have is a dispute, again a conversation, between St. Jerome and two other great doctors of the Church, and two other great doctors of the Church who are St. Gregory and St. Anselm, and St. Basil the Great. This is a dispute between the greatest theologians of this period of the Church. Since June of 2018, the Church has undergone massive restoration work. Daniela Storti, head of the restoration team, tells us about their work and the difficulties the team is facing. We started these works on the frescoes of the Church of St. Jerome of the Croatians in June 2018. We started with the dome, which is now finished, and then faced the altar frescoes that are all from the period of the Sistine painters. So we are talking about the second half of the year 500. We have finished these works, and now we are finishing the transept, as you can see behind me, which is instead of Pietro Gagliardi, dated 1850, to then face the nave, which is always by Pietro Gagliardi. The great difficulty, aside from the quantity of square meters of frescoes painted, is the difficulty of finding harmony in our restoration on different eras. Because we are talking about frescoes that are from the mid-16th century and from the 19th century, and therefore the difficulty of the restorer in finding two different historical periods is precisely to find a methodology that then gives to the final result a general balance on our work and especially on the vision, which then the public will have of the frescoes. The work is expected to conclude by the end of October 2019, bringing the church back to its original splendor. <laughs>